Hello, welcome to FinTech Impact. I'm your host, Jason Pereira. Today on the show, we have Clark Ritchie, CTO of FactGem. FactGem is a company that helps existing players restructure, retool, and better access their data in order to leverage it into better business intelligence. So essentially, they're a big data play, but they're the first principles of big data. They go in and clean up the data. And with that, here's my interview with Clark Ritchie. Hello, Clark. Hi. Thanks for taking the time. Thanks for having me on. Good. Well, we're both mutually snowed in, me in Toronto, you in uh, Baltimore. So great time to do a remote uh, podcast. So Clark Ritchie of FactGem, tell us about FactGem. Sure. So we started FactGem about six years ago, and we had two goals in mind at the time and, and still do now. First, we were intensely curious about linked data. We fundamentally believed that the connections between things, consumers, companies, people, addresses, products, could be a more valuable data source often than the actual properties about those things. So how is everything tied together? And then secondly, I've believed for a, a long time, having worked in the, in the big data space for many, many years now, that the industry makes it too hard for companies to deal with big data. We've been doing this for a long time, and there are best practices, there are tools, there are techniques out there that are useful. And I wanted to see if we could build a product or a set of products that allows people to use those techniques, those engineering methods, without having to actually write software themselves. So make it really easily available for the average person. All right. So we'll get, dive into that shortly. Uh, can you give me your history and what caused, uh, what, what was led to the foundation of FactGen? So uh, most recently, before joining FactGem, I was the director of public sector sales engineering for a company called MarkLogic. They're a database company headquartered out of Silicon Valley. As director of public sector sales engineering, I dealt mostly with the government's defense and intelligence sectors, which is actually true for the majority of my career has been in the defense and intelligence sectors. So, so it's a step down in terms of... Uh in terms of the severity of screw-ups, uh, <laughs> yes, everything else in the world, okay. Yes, absolutely. And dealing with some of the largest, hardest data problems in, in the world, because you're dealing with massive amounts of data coming in often very rapidly from sources you don't control, in formats you therefore don't control, and you have to make decisions very rapidly that are often clearly quite critical. So it was in that space that I really reached into that experience to develop some of these methods and, and techniques uh, for dealing with these large scales of disparate information, linking them together, but again, wanting to do so in a way that was really accessible. Excellent. So basically, when we had sum this all up, end of the story is data is warehoused in any number of places and any number of formats may never have been meant to be connected to anything else, but in the new world of technology, data is the new oil, right? Yep. This is what everybody wants to harvest because the amount of intelligence you can garner from it is proven by the likes of Google and unfortunately Facebook and um, a couple of companies that will not be mentioned that use their data. They're, you know, it's incredibly powerful stuff. You know, we can, we, you can very effectively market to people. You can very effectively figure out who and what they are, what they need, when they need it. But we never conceived of this when we started putting down the information. Right? Yeah. And even today, you start collecting info for something you're working on, you never think about it beyond the scope of that. So what's typically involved with trying to filter through this and creating the interconnectivity or the basically the context around this data? Yeah, you're, you're exactly right. That's a, a great way of framing it because these massive companies like Facebook and some others you mentioned, one, they have enormous amounts of IT capital. Right? It, it is nothing for them to have thousands of servers. And they've designed it. Uh, designed their infrastructure specifically to link together data of a certain type, so about its users and, and so forth, so they can sell it or do what they want to. But most companies weren't built that way. Companies that have been around more than you know six months, even you're using older techniques. You're you've got a payroll system, you've got a marketing system, you have a point of sale system, you have a merchandising system, and those are all valuable applications that are designed to do one specific thing. And as you said, now we've realized that there's so much more power in bringing those things together, but how do we do it? Because they are all, they're all, all siloed, they're disparate and, and, and disconnected at the moment. So for and a many systems that were never meant to communicate with anything else, right? That can be, absolutely. You know, not everything comes with an API, sadly. And very, and often very intentionally, vendors very intentionally very make true. them so they can't be 
uh, accessed via an API are easily integrated into something else. And that becomes a major problem. You see organizations that have a, a new analytic that they want to run or a new data source they want to integrate in order to affect, you know, ultimately the bottom line. And when they go to IT, IT tells that's a great idea. It's six to nine months. It's going to take $500,000 of internal spending just to get the data integrated into another queue that's going to sit over here. And the ongoing cost to your budget is going to be this amount. And very often that, uh, that's too much money. It takes too long because of the nature of the existing technologies. And it's interesting. This is, a, this is an area where newer companies, specifically in the fintech space, kind of have an advantage over incumbents, right? They may have data going back 30 years on a client, but it's in such disparate systems on such legacy technology and in formats that were never meant to speak to anything else that it's borderline useless without millions of dollars of spend just to try to tie someone's you know, identification number across three different platforms. So that's ex exactly right. If you look at some of the small companies that are being very disruptive in similar industries, so for example, insurance, their way they're doing it is not because they have some kind of financial leverage or capital that the really large companies don't have. That's absolutely untrue. It's because they're able to gather more information and connect it all together very quickly, right? So they're gathering information about your driving habits through a, a little black box in your car. They're getting information on your health from your Fitbit and your phone. They're getting information from your connected toothbrush. All of these points of data and linking them together and therefore being able to have analytics that give them better, the ability to build better models and make smarter decisions about what kind of care they want to offer you, what kind of coverage, what kind of plans. And the same thing can absolutely apply in the fintech space. When you're forced to deal with those legacy technologies where it's just billions of columns and things and rows, not connected, and then someone newer comes in and says, well, we may not have all the data you have, but it's all connected. Now you can just do things the larger companies can't dream of doing right now. Yep. And I mean, it's, it's an interesting challenge they have. And, you know, they, the, first of all, new companies are coming in with the intent of, of laying out the data in such a way that they're going to be able to leverage that in, in perpetuity, well, for lack of a better term, or until something else comes up that they can't connect it to. But the point is, is that they're, they're coming in with data design from day one specifically designed around openness and, and, and basically building an all-encompassing picture. And incumbents are basically backed into this corner where you have two choices. You either continue to let these people develop better profiles, better understandings, better systems around understanding what the client and consumer is doing and who they are, or you spend millions to try to get to the baseline level they're at now. Right. And it's hard. Right? A lot of these major financial institutions, they've been around for 100 years or more. And when you sit in those boardrooms, people say, well, why should we change the way we're doing this? This has worked for 150 years. And that's all completely true. And they have become very so prominent. The worst boogie whip. But you know what? Yeah. This is the core of disruption is saying that why should we change? The answer is, is that because everything has its own lifespan and yep. you're going to be a dinosaur in no time. That's right. And I think you're starting to see some real concern in the fintech space because of that. I recognize it's a space that is naturally uh, adverse to risk. But by, right. but by not changing, you're taking on tremendous amount of risk because I guarantee you there's 10 other companies at least that are looking to move into your space because they're going to think about the data in a completely different way and gain a competitive advantage. Well, it's interesting. I, like to, I often joke that the term fintech is actually something that shouldn't exist. If the companies that are incumbents saw them start to their, their core competency as basically being able to deliver those services in the most efficient way around the clients possible, they would have basically evolved their legacy systems over time, more likely than not, and not created the hole for these fintechs to, to, to basically come in. They've actually created their own worst nightmare. I, I say that, some people say, oh, you're being overly harsh, but you know, let's not kid ourselves. Some of these, some of these companies have systems to still run on punch cards overnight. We're not talking 1980s or still on Windows 95. We're still talking some computers that work off vacuum tubes in some cases. Yeah, it's absolutely true. I mean, having done a lot of work in the defense intel spaces, yes, you do see a lot of very old technology there because of the, you know, the same types of reasons. But the only time I've ever seen something at least as old has been in, in the financial sector. Nowhere yeah. else. What well, may lag behind nowhere else has, has the difference in change that significant. Yes. Well, I've tried to sell into, I, have, I know people have tried to sell into government and try to sell into finance and they, uh, they're debating what was the harder sell. Um, <laughs> unfortunately, yeah. well, I, you know, unfortunately, unfortunately, this created an incredible amount of opportunity in this space. Mm -hmm. And I tell you, it's, it's, 
the old saying about, uh, you know, I can't remember who said it, that if whoever you are, whatever business you're in, you better wake up every morning and thank God that Amazon hasn't decided to enter your sector. But frankly, there's a number of large traditional technology companies that have been very softly eyeing finance because the scalability of it is like nothing else. And they understand technology first and they understand client experience first. And those are things that are unfortunately lacking in a lot of financial services. So right. it's a very dangerous right. situation to be in. Absolutely. And you say, I mean, who would have thought a couple of years ago that Amazon would have entered the healthcare space and now they've softly moved into that or the uh, grocery space, but they've moved into that for the distribution. So well, I mean, even yeah. Apple allows you to keep money on your, uh, your Apple Pay uh, card on your phone now, right? So right. they've got a de facto transaction system with Apple Pay. So Yeah, absolutely. And there's a number, right? Uh, Venmo, Zelle, there's a lot of small companies now that are coming after not just microtransactions, which used to be what people thought of when you, when you thought that, oh, I'm going to pay a penny, I'm going to pay 10 cents, so it's not a big deal. No, people are doing major transactions here now, and it's, it's definitely affecting the bottom line of these larger finance companies. Yeah, classic innovator's dilemma. So when you sit down and meet with clients in the, first, in the first couple of meetings, and they're just kind of saying, hey, you're telling us you can fix this. Is the first job just education to how big the problem is? Or have they already assessed that and they're looking for support? So typically when I, when I sit down with senior leaders, so um, C-suite executives, uh, VPs, heads of lines of business, even senior, senior business leaders within those divisions, they tend to be acutely aware of the problem. And the reason is because they're feeling pain every day. They're having to ask people in the organization for answers and having to wait an exorbitant amount of time and spend an exorbitant amount of resources to get those answers. And it's because the data is separate and not connected. I know of a large healthcare company uh, that got a new CFO not that long ago and was asked by the CEO, how much business do we do with this particular hospital chain? And it took her nine weeks to get an answer. She was mortified. She thought she was going to be fired. And it was because this particular healthcare company has gone up through a lot of merger and acquisitions. And so really, it was like 50 separate systems that had to be queried and results had to be normalized across them and took nine weeks. You see that in a smaller scale all over the place. And so business leaders are very acutely aware because they're told, yeah, we can't really get that answer to you. It takes a long time to get that. Or, you know, we're spending essentially $150,000 or $200,000 every week to prepare for the weekly review. They, they wow. see it. They feel, they, they feel the pain. So I've got something else to add to that later. But so you're coming in there, I understand they're, they're coming to you for help. And basically your job is to go in there and do what? Like a data audit, understand the problem, put forward how you can fix it, and then, and then leave that charge? Yeah, we, you know, we, we try to educate them again a little bit about how it can be solved. But everyone wants to see it. Everyone needs to see a little bit of an example using their own data. So we try to tell them, look, let, it, let us come back in for a, you know, a third meeting, a second meeting, whatever it might be, and just provide a little bit of your own data. You don't even have to show it to us ahead of time. We can sit down right here in this boardroom and we'll link data from five, six different sources together right in the room. And you can see how you can answer those questions you couldn't answer before. That's incredibly powerful. Unfortunately, in some organizations, it's also where you hit a wall because now IT gets involved. And two things typically happen. One, IT will say like, well, you can't have the data. Can't have the data. We don't know these people. No one can see our data. Defending uh, their position. Yep. And then secondly, they say, well, oh, we can do that. We can do that. It's yes. not a problem. IT tells you, no, no, all the data is there. There is no problem. Everything is fine. We can totally uh, handle this inside but in, internally. Meanwhile, it's, you know, as you said, weeks and hundreds of spreadsheets and God knows how many manual errors because of it. So... Yeah, I mean, that, and to some degree, it's always been a challenge with innovation and technology, right? You, you have to find a way to help the internal IT department to realize you're, you're not there to replace them. You're not trying to take away their budget or their resources. You're really trying to give them another tool with which they can help the business be successful. Because the business ultimately isn't successful, there's not going to be an IT department. Exactly. You know, the same problem happens with a lot of financial institution and innovation centers, right? Where it's like, you know, they start vetting other third-party partners, but they've also bought all these, you know, high-priced developers into their own innovation center. And the innovation, the, guy, the innovation guys are like, we got to justify our existence. Oh, no, no, don't deal with them. We can build it. Well, yeah, but someone else already built it. So why are we wasting this time? The one place, and I beat up on them a lot, but the one place I do kind of sympathize with incumbents is that there's a real difference in expectation of culture between the different types of companies. So a traditional financial services executive is someone who basically climbed the ladder, 
And basically, it's not there because they disrupted a lot. It's because they basically stayed the course and delivered consistency and did so in, in an effective way. And the shareholders are demanding that they continue to raise the price, make the profit, and hit their dividends and increase their dividends, right? That's traditionally what people are looking for from traditional financial services people. So, but meanwhile, the tech guy has to make, it doesn't even have to make profit, <laughs> can basically be cash flow negative and can, you know, move as fast and break things as humanly possible. And you have, you know, when you, when you basically look at that and you climb to the top of that ladder and say, are you kidding me? I, there's no incentive for me to do what you're doing. I'm going to lose my job. Like right. as much as it may make long-term sense for me to, you know, cancel the dividend for 12 months and reinvest that money in infrastructure and solve our problem, I will get crucified, right? So the incentive systems behind both models are very much a complete polar opposites and create such a problem for them. It's, I, I totally, I, you know, you, 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 when you understand that, you can understand why some of these systems are so old because the executives are never rewarded for updating. <laughs> yeah, I know. It's just totally true. I mean, we, we used to have a, a saying back when we were at Mark Logic, which was no one ever gets fired for continuing to use Oracle. Right. <laughs> well, that apply. Yeah, you know, yeah. use that many times. IBM or yeah, Microsoft. Right. Yeah, and no one's going to get fired for that. But I agree. And 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 you know, additionally, it's also part. It's not just the risk, but it's also part of the way we've been conditioned to think about IT projects. Which is, I'm going to go in and do this. It's going to be a big project because I have to think about all of the things I might possibly want to link together in any possible case. Because after I do it, the cost of change is really high. And part of education is saying, well, yes, that used to be true. But now with these newer, modern approaches and technologies, that's no longer true. So I don't want you to think about how do I modernize my entire enterprise? Because that will take a while. Yes, that is high risk. And it's going to take a while for you to see ROI. So that is going to be a super scary level of change. Let's find something really small that we can deliver in two to three months that has a measurable ROI. So whether that's taking a process that right now, say, takes a week to answer a question and let's bring that down to you know three hours and measure that ROI or let's look at something where you said as business gosh we would love to be able to do this analytic against this additional data source but we've never been able to do it because getting that data link in is too hard great we can measure that ROI let's take small steps deliver incremental value so that yes the risk level goes down it's less frightening and it proves the fact that not only can you link data together now, but you can respond to change in an agile way because the business is always going to change. You're mm -hmm. never going to know what you're going to want data-wise in, in, in a month, in two months, in a year. Absolutely. And yeah, it's the entire, they look at the end state, which is super expensive and, you know, think they got to build the widget to end all widgets when they do right. it and, you know, fail to understand the simple wisdom of, you know, the old saying about how do you eat an elephant? Well, one yeah. bite at a time, right? And right. Uh, it's a common mistake. And it's funny because, you know, I've, in my side hustles, I see the same frustration, right? They're like, oh my God, look how much that company spent on, on doing, you know, everything you're talking about. And I'm saying, well, no, okay, like, let's, let's start with the, the things that you already are spending money on that we can replace that, well, basically, it's not a new expend, it's a shift in spending, but now your world is better and more lined up right. for success. Yeah, exactly. And again, you know, as a member of the IT industry, I mean, we take partial responsibility for that because we taught the business leaders hey, look, if, you're, if we're going to put together a new data source for you, it's going to be in an enterprise data warehouse. Those are either cubes or they're just giant columnar structures. And yes, once you have one of those, changing them is really hard and expensive. Well, but, it's a bunch of sunk cost as well. So the reward is minimal, right? Like, I mean, I think the, we can all say that AWS changed the game for everybody by providing a very reasonably affordable solution for people to stop worrying about maintaining their own servers. So when those servers started reaching end of life, it became a much easier decision to take data in this box, move it to a data offside box. But yep. it's, uh, you know, that, that was a first principle. That was the very first simple one to do. Just because it's there doesn't mean it's interacting with all the other pieces of data yet again. So you still have another problem. Right. Absolutely. Yeah. And, I mean, in an ideal world, I mean, you, you know, you look at, we're all getting so used to the concept of everything being instant, right? Like it's every little tech company you basically deal with these days, it's about delivery immediately or it's, it's instant gratification. And when you think of something as complex as a business and the strategic decisions you need to be making around money, the value of having what we'll call live information right up to the minute if you could it's hard to uh, to imagine because typically you know a lot of then you think about you think about just even financial statements and being able to make a judgment call on what's going on with the business month to month how long does it take to get even the month end financial statement done for a major corporation yep it takes 
months, or just days to weeks, depending on the corporation. Yeah, you're probably into the next month, and and then now you're another month behind, right? So, right. yeah, no, so yeah. it's and uh, right, and, and it's funny. Uh, you're completely right. So the paradoxical effect I've seen is we've come in and, and found, say, a reporting structure, and they said, well, we're generating these reports now, but again, that's a that's sort of a swivel chair integration, meaning someone sits down and they query this data source and they put it in Excel and they go and log into a different system and they pull data down and they put it in Excel. Oh, and you do that three or four more times and now it's all in Excel and then they do the analytic and now comes the report. That's how a lot of these companies do yep. those integrations. They say, okay, no problem. Let's take one of those and we're going to show you how you can take those data and link it together and automate it. And now you've gone from six days, for example, to an hour. And they go, that's yep. great. That's so fast. And then you go to the next one and it's something you've never even done before. And, you, and, it's, and they'll get massive amounts of data and uh, put it together. It's like, well, it takes about three hours. I'm like, three hours? That's ridiculous. Why can't it be in a tenth of a second? Yep. <laughs> like, well, you got to recognize yeah. you. Our expectations keep yeah, evolving. Right. Yeah. yeah. This, was, this, this was is impossible a week ago. <laughs> I, I love and hate Excel. Uh, I mean, love it for the obvious reasons, but hate it because, like, it becomes the acceptable shortcut for all these things, but the heavy lifting shortcut. A buddy of mine jokes, he wants to write a book one day called Excel Rules the World. And... Uh, <laughs> You, know, you actually understood, if most people understood just how many actual core business processes are run off of Excel spreadsheets, it would be frightening. But, and I always look at it as a point of failure. If you have to do that, it's because you haven't properly gotten your back ends talking to each other or turned into actual data. So I'm glad to see the trend is definitely evolving away from that, especially with newer products and newer services, creating those openings as opposed to saying, this is Fort Knox and will forever be Fort Knox and good luck ever getting it out of there. So, you know, what are some interesting examples of, of different disparate systems of data that you've managed to tie together that have, you know, what otherwise the general public would just never think would be relevant? Well, I thought it was really interesting to myself at least and paradoxically, and I think the general public thinks it probably is tied together in most cases, but it's really not, is, is we were, did some work for a uh, credit card provider who was interested in, in fraud. Mm -hmm. And they're experts in fraud, no doubt about it. We are not. And they uh, you know, gave us a whole bunch of sample data, including a bunch of fraudulent applications and you know the things that they typically uh, look at. So it's all the information coming from the Consumer Credit Bureau, which is massive, right? It's over 800, it was over 800 columns of data. And that, that basically comes to them from one external system. And then they have information about your application in one system. And then in another system, they have information about uh, existing accounts you might have and different transactions on them. And typically that's one system per account. So if it's a, if it's a company that carries multiple credit cards, there's multiple different systems there. And the goal is to put all of those together. Prior to doing this as a consumer, I would have thought those would already be together. It turns out, no, they're not for all the reasons we've already talked about. Yeah, based around cards, uh, not around identity. Yep. So the one thing we found, which was fascinating, I, I thought, was if you're going to have a, um, if you have a fraudulent credit card application, turns out what you typically do is you go out just to 7-Eleven uh, or somewhere and you buy a burner phone, right? You buy a, a prepaid cell phone, take some duct tape, put it in the back of the phone, you write your fraudulent name on it, you keep it on your desk. So you know if that phone rings, uh, it's for that application, and you answer with that name. Yep. That's typically the way that works. And so what you see in the data is you, that that phone number associated with that credit card application is not associated with anything else in the entire system. And that never, ever happens on a real application. In a real application, you see that, oh, Clark's phone for uh, this application is already associated with another account. Or it's associated with another individual probably his spouse, who's at the same address. And yeah. it's connect other things, because that's what real life looks like. Real life is highly connected. So a new, a new phone entering the system, specifically around a credit card application, is a massive red flag. Absolutely. And, and they had never looked at that before. And it's not because they're not super smart. They're women. It's exaggerated. They, they couldn't. To actually try to do that on their system would have been months just for one application. So I think it, it's this type of technology is allowing experts to rethink the kinds of questions they can ask and then for the kind of problems they can solve because we've boxed our data scientists, we've boxed our analysts into really an information cage and now we can really let them out and, and understand the, the complete totality of the company's data. And that's, you know, and you, know, you start thinking about the number of permutations, all the number of things that can be found through artificial intelligence, machine learning and the algorithms, you know, where, you know, this is low hanging fruit. Like those are, those are probably ones they've identified in the past. They just couldn't exploit it before. Whereas what are the systems going to find when they start profiling fraudsters and correlating that data across the entire body of knowledge? How many other cases they could be like, whoops, those were all fraudulent or, or catching them all earlier as those, those new trends emerge. Absolutely, right? It, it's the classic sort of offense-defense game. The, the people who are trying to commit fraud 
are always ahead of the curve. They're always in inventing new ways to yep. get around what's already in place. And uh, they don't have to worry about, well, I've got a, I've got some cost in an old enterprise data warehouse and a no. sand somewhere. No, they've got three or four old laptops cobbled together and they spin up some AWS servers and off they're off and running. Hilarious. It's, it's a real problem. So uh, we've been going out for over half an hour now, but, um, and I uh, thank you. This has been great. A couple ending questions I'd like to finish up with. If you had one wish about one thing you can change in your industry or your job, what would it be? I would want to remove the fear that exists in IT. Change happens so quickly in IT, whether you're, whether you're a software developer, whether you're maintaining systems, whether you're a systems administrator, there is real fear. Change is hard. There's so much that's happening, it becomes almost impossible to keep up with everything. If I could have anything, I would say creating an environment and a culture where we acknowledge that you're not going to know everything as it's changing, and we embrace your willingness to try and fail at new things. Excellent. That would definitely help you <laughs> out for sure. What have been the biggest challenges uh, that you maybe didn't foresee happening in running this company? Wow, this, that, that was, there's a lot of those. Um, <laughs> <laughs> there's a lot of those. You know, I would just say it's harder than I thought being on the leading edge of a new technology coming out. Even though it's been around for a little while, we're, we're trying to do things in, in ways that run contrary to what people believe you could do in the past using technologies people aren't familiar with. And there's more resistance there, again, than I had originally anticipated. There's, there's concern, there's fear, there's, it's just challenging. And it starts to change, but I think that was definitely more challenging than I originally anticipated. You know, it's interesting. I look at this as, it's, it's almost... The, the costs are definitely frightening, but I almost look at it as the new sunk cost server, right? Like they knew buying a server was going to be a sunk cost, but it was going to last them X number of years, right? And cleaning this up definitely is another sunk cost, right? Because you're going you're gonna to be able to reap the benefits for God knows how long. It's just, right. you know, it's, it's, you know, telling them that they're going to spend a bunch of money to clean up something that already exists. I kind of get the resistance. Yeah. So last question that I uh, wrap up with, what excites you the most about your company, what you're working on, the industry in general? What really drives you in the morning when you get up? Yeah. So I think what a really interesting inflection point now, the acceptance of this type of technology has definitely grown. We're actually seeing a huge uptick in, in government. The government is adopting this very strongly, which is a tremendous leading indicator because again, they, they're, they're in a lot of areas because there's new missionaries developing. They have fewer sunk costs, more urgent problems. So they're leading the charge. And we're at a tipping point. Standards are beginning to come out now. I think the business intelligence space is absolutely uh, ripe for massive change. If we look at existing BI, all of the existing BI tools in that market grew out of a need to understand what we put into rows and columns and tables. And no format other than rows and columns and tables. Yeah. Exactly, right. And yeah, and now that the underlying data does not necessarily have to be and probably shouldn't be in rows and columns, there's a huge disconnect there. And there is not an existing industry really built up around proactively doing analytics, not just understanding and visualizing what's happened, but what's going to happen. And that's a space we're really excited about and, and, and working with some partners and, and, and looking to grow into. And it's interesting because I feel like for several years there, and even got involved with one of them, there was a number of kind of just data visualization companies that were just coming up left, right, and center. And all it yep. was was Literally, like, here's an example of a spreadsheet. Here's an example of a beautiful dynamic report that is now interactive and just with one look, you yep. can, whether it be a map, the heat map or, or lines that, or a graph, it is just far easier to take in and be actionable on and do what if scenarios. And I feel like that, that was interesting because that's sort of, we almost kind of leapfrogged what you do to get there. Uh, unfortunately, what they do is not as, is basically limited by the fact that guys like you need to be in the middle first, to clean that up. Yeah, that's a huge issue. And the visualizations are super important and, and will always be important because we've got to understand and digest the data in a meaningful way. It's somewhat disingenuous in that a lot, most of those demos, most of the initial pilots, they're very small scale. And then you say, great, I'm now going to roll this out to the entire company, the entire brand, and you've got terabytes of data. Those things come to a crashing halt really fast, yeah. uh, even with lots of data. And again, it, it's all because of the underlying technologies and what's trying to happen there. And you run into real challenges. It becomes incredibly hard to do those things at scale right now. With that being said, I think the big fear in everyone's got, mind's got to be that the companies who execute on this right 
are going to have such first mover advantages. I mean, the, the challenge is executing on it wrong is incredibly complicated. But I mean, if you imagine, can, can you imagine a major tier one bank, you know, wave a magic wand and imagine that all their data was as it should be in a modern context, actionable, predictive, all of that, being able to throw AI at it. How far ahead do you think that bank would get in everything and how quickly? Oh, it'd be massive. I mean, you, you could change the game. If you could come to me as a consumer and be like, Clark, we understand what you're doing. We understand your financial situation and what you're spending. And this is the product that we think that you need that is better for you because you're paying too much right now and you're not getting enough value. Oh my God, you've got me forever. Yeah. Uh, but what you don't want, you know, unfortunately, the industry is at the opposite spec point on the spectrum right now where consumers have to go out and search for that. And then you figure out that, particularly if it's the same institution, hey, you've got a better product that's clearly way better for me and it's been there forever. Why didn't you tell me? Why did yeah. I have to go look? And then you get angry and often you switch. Or even new product design. I mean, like a classic way of, of determining what to build is to go out and essentially survey people or talk to your consumers. You know what's better than talking to them? Observing their behavior. Because talk is cheap and action actually tells you everything. And, yes. uh, you know, you know, look at that as you look at all the things that are possible with, um, with, the, with the application of behavioral finance in, in a lot of these new companies. And you say to yourself, wow, you know, you get into product design, you can really like, you can really figure out, maybe there's a Costco credit card, but maybe the trend is to shop at, you know, I'll pick on Amazon, but you know, somewhere else, some new online startup, or maybe yeah. there's a need for an Uber card, you know, whatever it is. And you can actually gauge that based on your actual client basis uses and needs, as opposed to just trying to figure out based on what they tell you. Right. Especially with all the mobile apps now. I mean, if, if you give me a mobile app that is helpful for me in that space, I'll install it. And 90% of us will give you pretty much whatever data you want to collect off of that. We don't really care that much. We're going to click through and say, fine. And so, yes, we're going to tell you exactly what it is we're doing. And then you can use that to, yeah, to provide those better products and services. Absolutely. It, it's, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's a double mind. You know, you get the people who are worried about the Orwellian nature of all this. But frankly, end of the day, you know, you can trust one incentive. And the incentive is they want to sell you more. So right. they take, you know, my trade-off is that if you're going to give me something of value in exchange for my data and something that better fits me, I'm willing to have that conversation, if not consent to it. So Yeah, absolutely. And I think the grocery stores have been the best in that space. If you want to, if you, yeah. someone's going to look to a leader because they operate on such low margin, they have to have your loyalty and your repeat business. So the way yeah. they are using loyalty cards, uh, mobile apps to to deliver you coupons and savings is really way in advance of what any other industry is, is doing. So they're well, great. That, that example, it's hard get having, you know, figuring out that someone's daughter was pregnant before they had told their father. I can't remember which book that was in, but it was yeah. just like, all you had to do was look at, you know, it was based off the fact that she was shopping for three things. And then they sent her, you know, a coupon for like a crib and diapers. And it was, it was a all great right. story. Well, on the new Target app now, right? So you, you, now you pay with your phone, with, a, with your own Target credit card, but you can get coupons, but they don't necessarily, sometimes they'll tell you in the store, like scan this and you get a coupon. Others, they don't advertise. So what they want you to do is you pick something up, you think you might want to buy it, and then you scan it and it tells you if there's a special offer and you get the discount. But what they're actually finding out is everything in that store that you're actually interested in looking at hard, you're scanning. You may not buy it, but now they know you are interested in it. That's right. It's, it's genius. Create your shopping, create your wish list while you're going. Anyway, Clark, thank you very much. This has been uh, been interesting. It is a brave new world. And uh, this is, what can I say? You're the man fixing the plumbing. So uh, glad to have you here. <laughs> thank you. And, uh, great here. Hopefully we'll get some better weather soon on both ends. <laughs> Agreed. Agreed. Thanks again. So that was my interview with Clark Ritchie, CTO of Factchem. Hope you enjoyed that and came to understand some of the challenges that what we on the outside think are very simple in terms of acting upon can often be months, if not years, and millions of dollars of work just to get basic data where it should be. But nevertheless, the upside of big data is enormous. So with that, as always, if you enjoyed this podcast, please leave a review on iTunes, Stitcher, wherever it is to get your podcasts. Until next time, I'm Jason Furrow. This podcast was brought to you by Woodgate Financial, an award-winning financial planning firm catering to high net worth individuals and their families. To learn more, go to woodgate.com. You can subscribe to this podcast on iTunes, Stitcher, and Google Play, or find more episodes at fintechimpact.co.